Welcome to Script the Screen Shape of Water. Uh, we're very excited that you all will be able to come out tonight. A uh, special thank you to Fox Searchlight. They are letting us see this movie before it's been released anywhere. Uh, it starts in New York tomorrow, but we're getting an advanced screening, so we're very appreciative of Fox Searchlight, what they've done. Our guest tonight has written and produced for a lot of TV shows, Alias, Everwood, Jack and Bobby. Uh, she also wrote for a show that got, it's gotten very little press, no one's ever heard of it, Game of Thrones. Uh, she wrote for another little known actress, Meryl Streep, for Hope Springs. She wrote the first book in the Divergent series. Adapted it, not the focus, sorry, she adapted it. So please welcome to the Polythea Street, the screenwriter, Vanessa Taylor. Oh my. All right, so our first question is, did you know that an egg would become the most romantic symbol in cinematic history? I did not. I did not know that. <laughs> All right, let's go back to the way beginning. So what was the initial meeting with Guillermo Toro like, and you know, how did you guys you know, decide to collaborate on this very unique script? It was so, um, I heard that he had this passion project idea that he wanted to do, and that it was kind of in the vein of some of his early work. Um, and so I was asked, would you want to come and just hear him tell you about the idea? Um, and so I met with him and he told me the idea and I just thought it was so wonderful that it was this fairy tale set in this period. I thought that was so interesting. Um, and so then we sort of agreed to talk again because I think he was meeting with maybe a couple people and so we had another meeting where I tried to come up with coherent questions about it. And then I think there was supposed to be another meeting or something um, to determine if I would get it, and I was really excited to do it. And then I heard he had essentially left the country, so I guess I was going to do it. <laughs> I was like, wait, what, what happened to the meeting? Um, so, yeah, it was, but I instantly saw, I mean, he had such a clear vision of what he wanted. It was very easy to see what it would be, and to me it just was a question of, could you get everyone to buy in visually to this creature? and that as a love story, but I had just seen Crimson Peak, and I thought he was so gifted visually, I thought, well, if anyone can do it, he can do it, so fingers crossed. It must have been challenging, because from a structure standpoint, the story structure, yes. you have to balance lush <clears throat> musical, fairy tales, romance, film noir, monster movies, and a James Bond spy genre. Yeah. How do you guys do that? I honestly, I think that may be one of the, I mean, I think Guillermo has consistently worked with a co-writer, but I sort of feel like the rest of it, he really pretty much knew. Um, but to get that structure to kind of work was a little bit of sort of the task of it. And um, I, I actually thought tonally, it all felt pretty much of a piece, but, um, but it was just a matter of making the sort of uh, suspense beats kind of work in that context. And it, to me, it was just sort of a lot of like work, elbow grease type work <laughs> of seeing what didn't work and then just sort of figuring it out. Uh, well, let's take the monster. Does it, when you write like a monster job, we'll just take the monster movie. Theme. Does they free you up a little? Because you can go, you can actually, you're not, you don't have certain limits. Well, everything about this sort of freed you up because it was a fairy tale, it's a monster, it's set in a period, so you're trying to be realistic, but not entirely. But to me, that was one of the interesting things I learned, I, I think I learned quickly working with Guillermo, was I kind of assumed he might want someone who would be very um, structurally disciplined and who would ask all the logic questions. and. Um, and I started to do that with him and I suddenly realized like, oh, he's not interested in this at all. He <laughs> wants to have complete freedom to tell this story and that's what he wants me to have too. And he wants both of us to tell the coolest, weirdest, and for no one to be concerned with these sort of dumb and pedestrian questions that I'm bringing up. <laughs> and so I was like, all right, we're done with that. Let's, you know, forget it. Now, normal screenwriters have something called verbal dialogue to work with. Right. <laughs> now you have a, a script where Eliza has a great strong character voice without speaking. What was the challenges of creating her kind of voice? Yeah, it was so interesting because I, I, 
said once before, when I, I called my dad to tell him about the possibility of this movie, and I was saying how great it was, and he was like, well, it sounds like the two leads don't talk. <laughs> so it's going to be a love story? That doesn't really seem like it's going to work. And I was like, Dad, don't you get it? That's what's great about it. And he was like, no, I don't get it. <laughs> but I, I mean, to me, I felt like Sally Hawkins could do whatever we needed her to do. And you really don't need, I mean, if I know this is going to sound so lame, but anybody who's a dog lover, you really don't need words. You know, you, you really don't. Um, what you do need is a neighbor. Because without that character, you have no idea what she's thinking, ever. <laughs> um, but yeah, I thought, I thought we had enough people around her that we could do it. And that's actually interesting, because you have uh, her voice translated by a gay man and a black woman, two members of the other oppressed mm -hmm. groups. What was, how did you balance all that, crafting these relationships and misfit share of voices, sharing of a voice? Hmm. Well, I mean, I think Guillermo was very much aware from the beginning of this idea of the other and of every character in this being sort of that kind of person, a person who had experienced being on the outside. And, um, and so I think it always played thematically that way. And I think as far as her voice, it was really more just a matter of being authentic to what that character was. and. To me, it always felt like because she was mute, we were able to make her a little more mysterious, which to me worked well with the fairy tale. Because I felt like if you had actually had her speaking and she had been able to be like, well, I was found in a river at such and such a time and here's what the thing is on my neck, like you would, ha you would generate all these questions you couldn't really answer. Um, and so we, we were able to sort of slip past by having her have that. Okay, I'm going to ask the question, and I know for the sake of plausible deniability, you can probably say you can't answer. Do you know Eliza's backstory? As a writer, did oh. you know going in the uh, the uh, well, like, well, I have the my baby thoughts about it? But does that um, help you write? But I did not say to Guillermo what is <laughs> you know what is this thing in your mind. So I have no idea if I'm right about it. I just but you but know, you, you have a point of view as a writer. Yeah. You you read for it. Interesting. You don't have to tell. Uh, all right, so let's, let's talk a little Richard Jenkins, uh, Giles, mm -hmm. who, who, wonderful performance. His character is in exile, but doesn't give up his art. He's silenced in career in love, but strong and defiant. You know, while he silences himself, he speaks for Eliza. How did you approach like, so, such a dynamic character? There's so many facets. Well, to me, again, it's sort of all about the emotional life of these people, and it was so clear what he wanted, you know, wanting connection and wanting a chance to express his art and reach his full potential and why he was being thwarted with that. And so I think, you know, you always look at it from that perspective, sort of inside out versus outside in. This is because normally he could have been the father figure, which I found mm -hmm. interesting because she was kind of the mother figure. Right. Uh, but they both, but it was an equal relationship. So yeah. it was, so did you have to develop, how, how was the relationship built then? How would it? Well, again, I mean, Guillermo had so much of this. He had sort of the concept of it. And so I didn't have to build things so much as walk into them and keep, you know, continue them. Um, but he already had sort of the idea for this relationship that she was bringing him food and that, and so from that very small scene, you kind of understood their dynamic. Um, and so a lot of this was just a matter of sort of playing in Guillermo's sandbox, like g picking up the, sh the sort of filaments that he had put out and, you know, building it out a little bit. Now, how did you view the, uh, the other relationship with Zelda? Because Octavia Spencer was opposite a lot of right. Giles, but for outspoken, you know, talkative. Yeah. So how did you approach her? To me, it's interesting because I think something that we went back and forth on a little bit in drafts was how helpful or supportive that character was going mm -hmm. to be if she was rather going to be frightened and therefore not be helpful or even be sort of obstruction. Um, but, you know, she ended up sort of being supportive and being sort of part of that main plot. And how excited were you when you heard Octavia Spencer was going <laughs> to speak your words? <laughs> I really, this entire cast, I mean, whenever you write movies, you tend to work with people who are famous or whatever, but 
this entire cast is full of people who I just think are really brilliant at what they do, and so meeting them was just a complete thrill, and hearing them do the lines was a complete thrill. They're all just consummate artists. Now, obviously, opening sequences are critical. The movie sets the tone. You've got a lot of interesting things happening. You know, the water, the uh, yeah. submerged. Uh, you see your sexual nature, uh, you right. would not say it, lonely as role as a caretaker. How did you guys you know, workshop that? Because it really kind of... Again, and I off. hate to say it, but I think he came into this with a lot of that. I mean, we knew, I think it, it went back and forth on whether she was actually floating or how much water <laughs> was there, basically. <laughs> But um, he had a lot of those images from the very beginning, the eggs, the bathtub. I, in the beginning, I was sort of logic police on the timer. I was like, so I don't understand. Does she not have enough time? She has too much time? Like, what's <laughs> happening with this timer? I don't really get it. Um, and then I had to let that go. Uh, but you know, he, he had this imagery about the water um, sort of from the very beginning. and and. Uh, and the voiceover, which, you know, I'm always a little bit on the fence about voiceover, but I think for him it was really important to set up the tone that this was a fairy tale. Yeah, uh, the, uh, but in the music, movie musicals, I mean, that was, uh, what was the selection process, what songs you're going with? I mean, the great moment with her dancing, like the mimic the dancing. Yeah, I, I, again, you know, so much of this was there from the beginning. I'm sure I pitched a few things in different drafts of what it could be, but he had a lot of knowledge of this time period and sort of what, and, and it was interesting because we were dealing with the 60s, but he wanted to evoke sort of 40s era in the music and, and in stuff yeah. they were watching, which I thought was interesting, but I think had to do with the tonality and romanticism of it. And speaking of the 60s, I mean, you have now you have the evil government agency. Right. Uh, the great opening sequence with Belden coming in. So did, was that always established? Did you always know what that was going to be entailed? Or? Um, there was always the idea that they worked in this lab. There was some variation as to how they got inside the building. But the basics of the lab and what the lab was doing, I think there was also a little variation in what we were seeing in terms of the science that was happening at the lab. Um, but I think the most change that happened was sort of around the Russian plot and the idea of the spy sort of element to it. It seems like you guys are having a lot of fun with genre elements and mixing, you know, playing tricks yeah. on us. Because let's take, let's take the amphibian man. I mean, he's a traditional monster, but now suddenly he's betrayed as the other, but you give him compassion right. without dialogue immediately. How was that kind of, kind of just breaking our monster myth? Well, I mean, I, I think you named it. You know, you, you see him and he's, it's a little bit of a frightening image, but then very quickly you um, have empathy for him, but he's still, you know, he's still animal in his impulses. Mm -hmm. And so you, you're sort of, I think, intentionally don't know whether he's entirely benign or whether he's not. Um, yeah. She, uh, but now, of course, we meet the real monster of yes, the movie, the uh, Str Strickland, <laughs> uh, mask of power, but really weak in, uh, yes. underneath. How, how did, you, what was the rela development of the relationship in regards to Eliza, especially? Because they were the you ones. You know, it's interesting because I think as the script progressed, I think through a lot of our development of the script, that character, um, you see in the film that there's some lightning of his character. He's reading, you know, this book, and he's when he goes to get his car, and there's a, a bit of humor around who he is. And I think that came a little bit later in the process. I think that mainly he was sort of this very dark, um, focused character, and um, you know, meant to be that embodiment of that impulse to suppress the other out of fear. Yeah, I thought it was especially that scene was especially upsetting with the bathroom. Yeah. yeah. Just trying to like, you know, <laughs> dominate over them and uh, that was. Yeah. It was. Well, fun. <laughs> <laughs> Creepy, but fun. <laughs> did he have, did he have any, did you, any concerns about his character or something like he was worried about the balance of it? Michael or Shannon. Michael Shannon. Oh, that I don't know. I wasn't on set for this. So I, you know, I'm assuming not because he seems like he walks in and does what, he seems like he can sort of do anything, but. 
His character took it pretty well getting his fingers bitten off, though. Yeah, <laughs> I enjoyed that whole thing about the black fingers, and that was really <laughs> great. And it's, uh, all right, well, let's talk a little about Hofstetter. Another, now you're playing again with genre, because he's the Russian, he's the villain, right. but he's drawn the amphibian man, and uh, you're messing with our preconceived notions again. Yeah. Uh, what was his development for you? Well, of course, he's the other in certain ways, too, and I really did enjoy uh, the writing of that character, just because I found him so, um, I found myself feeling such empathy for him. He's caught in this sort of impossible situation, and he genuinely is a man of science, and he feels this real, um, almost innocent or romantic admiration for this creature, and he's sort of trapped. Yeah, and I thought it was a brilliant place on the line of uh, when he basically acknowledged that he's a Russian spy. Yeah. And it was, <laughs> and we didn't care, and right. we just didn't do that. Uh, now we have, all right, so the romance. Now obviously the, it's all based on the romance. We have, you have to convince us that she's right. going to fall in love with him. Uh, so how do you balance building with music, love, and eggs in all in a short period of time to convince us that she's going to do this? Well obviously so much of this is sort of being carried on the back of Sally Hawkins, right? <laughs> um, but we knew that she could carry it. Um, and of course on Doug Jones as well, who I think is so incredibly expressive, um, and that beautiful monster suit. But um, I, to me, I never really doubted that the romantic elements of it would play. I doubted that the sexual, like mm -hmm. I, I wondered about the sexual elements. I thought, is everyone gonna be sitting there going, could that really, like, <laughs> you know, like, mm, I don't know. Um, and so I was happy when I saw the film to see how physically beautiful he was and how, how much it managed to be infused with sensuality because I felt like that went a long way to helping us to really get that. Yeah, you and I talked a little backstage about the fact that it was practical sets, like Rick and Jenkins love it, and it must be Doug Jones. Could that have actually even worked if he was in a green suit? Did you think how much that really helped their performance, I having mean, real sets, knows? real you know, monsters? People do a million things in green screen, but I'm sure that it was helpful to everyone to, to be doing it practically. All right, so to me, the heart-wrenching scene is when Eliza argues with Giles. He doesn't know what I lack or how I'm completely just seizing for what I am. Now, we know how she's feeling, but we also know Giles cannot jump at it yet. She, he can't actually right. help her. So how did you know? What, what was the disimpression knowing when he was not ready to help her? Well, it's interesting. I think what we sort of went back and forth on many times was what compels him, right? So there has to be something that compels him. And there were many, many different versions of what sort of ultimately compels him. Um, and some of them were sort of more um, dramatic or violent. You know, something really terrible happens versus... Um, and it's interesting because throughout, that was probably for me the biggest question in the script was what do we put here and is this going to work? Because we, we need to have him turn and we need to have people believe that. Um, so it's interesting, I think, I think it does pretty much work. You know, it, it does make that point, but it, it was definitely for me, I think, a challenging thing to sort of figure out. Well, and that leads us to the pie scene, which is probably the most <laughs> devastating, uh, especially for him. I mean, so was that, so was that, what, did you have to wrestle with that scene a little? Yeah, yeah. So, so there were, you know, the character of the pie man was always there, and, but the question of sort of how involved Giles was with this person, and, you know, how, how far to take them into this before it goes wrong, and how wrong does it go, and in what way does it go wrong, and, um, were sort of the questions we were asking. But it really does set up well why now he's going to help her. Yes. Yeah, the devastation and the loneliness. Yes. All right, so we're, we're going to get a little fun. The heist. <laughs> How was an action fast heist scene with people who are kind of inept mm -hmm. fun to write? Oh my God, so <laughs> much fun. So much fun. Um, you know, that's kind of the great thing about when you're writing something that's a fairy tale and period and a monster movie, you can kind of do anything. I mean, at a certain point, you've created your own reality, and yeah. so you don't need to be bound by totally the laws of it. And I think it has its internal logic and works, but it's really fun to not have to be quite so precise. And did you enjoy wrecking his teal car, uh, Strickland's <laughs> teal car? <laughs> Who wouldn't? <laughs> yeah. uh, also, the great payoff moment when, uh, after he interrogates, Eliza Strickland, he gives, she gives him the F you yeah. in sign language, uh, was probably my favorite, you know, yeah. triumphant motive. 
All right. So let's talk, we, we talk a little about the, the sexual relationship. All right. So you bring uh, amphibian man into Eliza's world. You have cat eating and interspecies sex. Right. Were there any concerns of how far you can push the cats and the sex? No. I mean, I was, I was constantly the person who was like, is this horrible enough? Like, we need to make this really horrible. Like, maybe he should eat a kitten. Maybe he should eat Giles. Like, what could he do that's, like, so terrible? Your mom was like, no, no, the cat's fine. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but, yeah, no. I mean, I think, again, it was sort of like we're in this magical realm. We just need to do the things that emotionally fill this. I did like the touch later when he's petting the cat. Yeah. You know, like Richard Dixon, like, please don't do it. But you know, <laughs> right. he didn't, you know, he's a good guy. Yeah. All right, so there is one thing I do have to talk about a scene. As someone, as a director of a theater, mm -hmm. I cannot condone what you did pouring water through the roof of a theater. <laughs> now, it is an emotional impact, almost made up for it. Right. Uh, so well, so what, was, what was the impetus of putting her above a movie theater? And how was that weaved in for you as a storyteller? Huh. Again, I... This may have pre-existed me on this project. I think he had the movie theater when I came, and I think part of it had to do with setting up the sort of nostalgia of the period. Um, but I haven't talked to him specifically about the movies that we're showing there. Um, but yeah, it, it seemed to be all part of this sort of visual language. Oh, it was amazing when he's actually watching the movie. Yeah, yeah like, just totally amazed by you know the magic right. of movies. <laughs> I just freaked out a little about the water. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right, so the musical number is stunning. Uh, oh. Did that bring anything special to you that you were able to you not convey through the sign words? Did it kind of free you up doing the musical number? I, I do think that was, I mean, again, it was always part of it. And so you were thinking, well, if this is a movie where you know a guy eats a cat and also <laughs> there's this sex that's not human and also there's a musical number like it's it's got such a fantasy element to it that you really feel like okay pretty much within tonally a certain area I can do whatever I want. Yeah. Uh, interesting use of production design how his art Richard Jenkins art was changing mm -hmm. throughout the movie. Mm -hmm. uh, what was your view when you finally saw that like the set design on the when you first saw it on this big screen? Wow. Well, as I think I mentioned to you, you know, I had been aware that Guillermo was doing this on a pretty tight budget. And I was just incredibly impressed with what he was able to bring to screen for so little money. I mean, it, it's really, to me, he's such a visual master. Um, and I thought that before I started working with him. But then to see this, which to me looks so sumptuous, and it was just done on a shoestring. Um, all right, so we'll, we'll talk a little about the climax. A lot going on there. Uh, <laughs> Eliza kind of dying, but getting reborn with a voice. Uh, Strickland losing his voice. Was there any other, how did you guys zero in on how you were going to resolve their conflict? Well, I think it was always meant to be, you know, that she would go with the creature, and obviously the things on her neck sort of set that up. And, um, and I know Guillermo always had wanted to have a poem there, although there was some back and forth about what that would be. Um, but I think it was pretty much, you know, you knew it had to be the end for him. It was just more a question of the mechanics of it. How do you get everybody there and who all needs to be there and how does it sort of all play out to feel very satisfying? I like the recognition that Strickland says, you are a god. Was I think my favorite I like last yeah. word. Uh, and he's so bummed out. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, do we have a lot of Guillermo del Toro fans in the audience? Woo! Okay. <laughs> from, uh, from a thing of applause, how many of you were worried, like I was, that he was going to do a depressing ending? No, see. <laughs> you can admit it. I was, uh, thank you for not, as we talked about. Uh, all right, so a little, let's talk a little about, yeah, let's talk a little about the, narr the narration and the poem. So what... In your mind, did you want to guys leave a little ambiguous as a fairy tale, or you just wanted to? No, I mean, I think, you know, Guillermo had wanted to set up from the beginning that it was going to be this fairy tale. It's just to me the question of what was the content of that voiceover, because you want it to set the tone, but it also has to say something. Um, and then to have a poem at the end, again, 
is you know, lovely and very romantic, but you want to have the right poem so that it, it feels sort of rich and not um, you know, sort of tacked on or put on. Or, um, and I, I think he, he landed at a good space. You know, there were versions of this where there was more sort of poetry scattered in throughout the script, but I really preferred it this way. And, uh, well, the only sadness is obviously <laughs> Richard Dakins is going to be separated. Yeah. Yeah, but <laughs> it was worth it. All right, so the concept of being afraid of the other, immigrants, powerful men trying to dominate mm -hmm. uh, women through intimidation <laughs> and sexual dominance, <laughs> Russians are villains. When writing this, did you have any ideas within the last month of society this would all come to life? <laughs> I did not. <laughs> I was not focused on that at all. I think Guillermo would probably have a different answer because as an immigrant himself, these issues were always in the forefront for him. So he was sort of ahead of us all on this, or at least ahead of me. Um, but yeah, it's kind of astounding how that sort of happens. Uh, so you, uh, we have a little talk about backpacks. Screeners always have a vision of their, your head. How did that jive with when you actually saw the final product on the big screen? Honestly, I feel like it was pretty close. And I think that's because Guillermo was able to express to me so clearly what visuals he had in mind. And so from the very beginning when I was writing, I was writing to a visual sort of mm -hmm. template. Um, and so I wasn't particular, and, and also because obviously I was very familiar with his work and um, so I, I wasn't, I mean, as I said, I was surprised at how big it looks, given how little it cost. But I wasn't surprised, sort of generally, by the tone. Uh, so, I mean, obviously, how has been the festival run? <laughs> I mean, you know, the attention, all the stuff, especially all your colleagues are sharing in it, from just, the actors yeah. to the production designer, the sound, the great score. Yeah. yeah. Yes, beautiful. Um, yeah, I've never been involved in this whole award situation before and it's really interesting it really is an entire season and an entire many many events and um, it's it's just a part of Hollywood I really haven't experienced before all right so I, I do have to ask another piece of work you've done uh, you wrote for Game of Thrones uh, are we Game of Thrones fans out here <laughs> okay uh, and you also wrote the episode with John and Egret meet Jon Snow <laughs> right. the, the romance mm -hmm. now just to compliment you, as someone who's had two relationships that ended just like theirs, you nailed it. Uh, <laughs> what, was, what was it like writing their budding romance? Oh my god. It, to have the work of George R. R. Martin as your sort of basis, and of course, as time has gone on, they've moved past, you know, but at that point we were still writing essentially to the books. And um, my bosses on Game of Thrones would often tell me, like, use more of your dialogue and less of George's dialogue. But I would say, why? Because George's <laughs> dialogue is terrific. Like, his writing is so phenomenal, and there's so much richness to the world and the characters. I, it just, it was such a great place to be inhabiting. It really was. So is there a little more pressure when you have that in some ways? Because you, 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 when, when do you decide to go off a book? Because you also, you are diverted too. Is there some kind of... Yeah, balance, I mean, you think about when you push it, when well, you Well, Divergent, the answer was, please don't ever go off the book, because the fans <laughs> really will be angry. Um, but I think in Thrones, there was a lot more freedom, um, maybe just because my bosses sort of wanted it to be that way. But um, yeah, I mean, I think there were departures when they needed to for production or for story reasons, and, and departures in order to flesh out some things that maybe weren't as heavily covered in the books, but uh, but it was it was always just a joy to head in whatever direction those characters wanted to go. Was Joffrey fun to write? Oh, so <laughs> fun! And that guy could not have been a nicer. Like that actor was a student um, in Dublin, and he would just come to set, sit and read his books, get up and be evil, <laughs> get on a train and leave. It was amazing. <laughs> But tying back to Guillermo, in some ways, do Game of Thrones help prepare you for, uh, oh, yeah. you know, Shape of Water? Certainly, I think Game of Thrones required a certain flexibility and creativity in terms of structural storytelling that I think is useful for any experience. So, uh, well, let's. Why don't we a uh, chance to ask? Let some of the audience ask a couple of questions. Hi. Hi. 
Uh, so just a simple question. Uh, I realized that in the first half of the film, there is a lot of use of side story of the side characters, and it really links back to the main plot later on in the film. I just want to know like who made that choice because it's just like very subtle and just mm -hmm. very creative. It just works really well. Hmm. Well, I think generally that's all sort of just part of, you know, setting up how you're going to have something that feels cohesive. I mean, we sort of talked about we have all these different elements going on and you're wanting to pull it through um, with some momentum of this thriller. And so you really can't have a lot of sort of loose ends. Everything has to, I think, feel necessary or else it just sort of drops out. And so I think that's kind of just part of how you're um, working on the structure. But I thought it was interesting introducing Octavia Spencer's husband at the end. Right. Yeah, that was interesting. Because <laughs> right. we didn't need to see Well, we her. knew who he was because she had been talking right. about him. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. I enjoyed the film so much. Right. And I was just wondering, there was a detail right at the beginning. I was really captivated by this fire that was going on and the sirens. And I wondered <laughs> if you had anything you could add to that. Uh, you know, again, I think that was in it from such an early point. I mean, from almost the very beginning, there was this idea of this chocolate fire and the smell of the <laughs> chocolate fire, and like it was just so random. Some of this stuff, I, and I don't know, I've, I've read and heard Guillermo say that he was working on it since, you know, I think 2011, and I, so I don't know where all of these things came from. They seem to have been in the works for a long, long time, but I love those little details, and I loved when I actually saw it, because of course, it had been in the script over and over and over again, but I didn't really realize we would actually look at it. <laughs> and I was like, oh, wow, that's kind of great. <laughs> okay, so the story is like a fairy tale. It's really beautiful. It's really romantic. I wanted to ask about like the gore and the, like, the finger, the, mm -hmm. the, when he put his finger in his mouth. Like, what was, um, I mean, it's great fun to watch, but like, <laughs> what was like the, I guess, motivation behind that, like, horror? Um, well, I, you know, part of this largely is directorial, so I don't want to be answering for Guillermo. He would answer whatever he would answer. Um, but I think for me, it, it's, you know, there's a certain way in which the Strickland character has been presented as a fairly average, normal, person, the sort of banality of evil or whatever. Um, and then in that scene, you're really seeing truly how awful he is. And I sort of feel like that's what you're looking at. Is, is that awfulness really revealed? Because it's so gratuitous. He doesn't need to do that, you know. Um, but again, that's a directorial choice. So Guillermo might say something completely different. Thanks. Thank you. It was beautiful. Um, I'm curious because you've been so wonderful about giving so much homage to your collaborator. Um, when you watch it, is there something in the film, a line or a moment or a detail that's, that you just go, oh, that's mine and I'm so proud of it? <laughs> <laughs> you know, there are a few lines that I think like, oh yeah, I did that. Um, but honestly, what I, uh, what I think I actually contributed to this script is less in terms of those kinds of specifics, as much as I might have wanted to, um, and more in terms of a little bit of the sort of backbone and structure of how it coheres, which is sort of not a very sexy thing to have contributed, <laughs> I'm aware. Um, but I really think that's kind of the case because, not because I didn't, you know, want to add these other details or didn't certainly offer up lots of versions of different scenes, but because Guillermo had such a clear picture in his mind and he really, I think, just needed a kind of like sparring partner to get things kind of on the rails. Um, and so, you know, you, you kind of go where you're needed. Um, but yeah, there's certainly a few lines where I'm like, oh yeah, I wrote that, and that's still in there. And I'm, yeah, I, yeah. Anyway, I try not to think that way too much. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I was wondering, because 
uh, Guillermo del Toro is an immigrant, and it's such an Americana film. The plot, the, mm -hmm. the props, <coughs> it is so American down to the jello, you know, and the pies. And I'm just wondering, is this his perception of America and its history? How much of it is you bringing in the Americana? Yeah. I think, you know, it's interesting because when I first met with him, I thought, oh, so he wants me, you know, he's not a native English speaker, he's not from here, so he wants me to kind of be that in some way. That's what I'm bringing. I'm the American who's going to somehow infuse this with Americana and Americanness. But it was interesting because he had such specificity to what he wrote about that. I mean, Guillermo's incredibly erudite, and I think he's thought a lot about this period of time. And he's talked about sort of that it's Camelot and it's this moment that we've sort of crystallized as a, as a national ideal and that there were all these sort of things going on underneath. So ultimately, I, I felt like, I, I certainly, I did a lot of research about the time period, and I certainly brought similar elements, but I don't think I originated these elements. You know, I think he was already sort of wanting to infuse it with all that, and I was just bringing some extra detail. And I do think he was very, very focused on setting it in this very specific moment in time, and so he wanted to paint that moment in a very, very specific way. Uh, great film, I loved it so much. Um, so you've worked on a number of like high profile sets, like working with Guillermo del Toro, working on Game of Thrones. How has it been working on these kind of high profile things as opposed to working on like a smaller budget or like smaller like film? Well, this film actually, relatively speaking, is a smaller film in certain ways. It's high profile in terms of the people associated with it, but it's not um, a gigantic, you know, blockbuster sort of situation. And I actually think, um, and Guillermo has said this many times, but working with Fox Searchlight is such a joy because I think they allow so much creative freedom. Um, and so I think that probably just never happens as much on some sort of giant high profile thing. Um, personally, you know, I, I'm not the director or producer, so it's not my problem, the fact that you don't have as much money. Um, so I can look at it from a relatively privileged standpoint, but I do appreciate, sometimes I think in these um, larger films, you can end up with some waste because you have more resources. And, um, and I think sometimes it's nice to have to be sort of more creative. I was um, saying backstage, Game of Thrones was actually not high profile when I began working on it. When I began working on it, I first went there during season one to begin writing for season two. And I remember um, someone telling me a story that they had tried to get into a bar in Belfast, Ireland, which by the way, it is not hard to get into a bar <laughs> in Belfast. And they had said like, oh, we're here with the creators of Game of Thrones. And the door guy was like, and? Like, I don't even know what that is. Like, nobody knew who anybody was. Nobody knew who the actors were. Um, and it was kind of great, the fact that there was just, it felt like sort of a family theater company. Um, everybody hung out at the same pubs. And, and I'm, I'm sure now, you know, I haven't been there in a long time. I'm sure now it's a very different vibe, now that they're all famous and, you know, dating or marrying famous people and being photographed and, and um, to me, it was so wonderful that it was like nobody knew who we were. It felt like we all had this sort of secret that you know nobody else knew. Do you feel responsible for getting Kit Harrington and Rose Leslie to oh, get yeah, married, John me. and Regret? Because they are engaged yeah. in real life. Yeah, it was all me. Um, yeah, it it actually they were awesome and such nice people, and was really happy to hear the news. Oh, we have time for one or two more questions. Hi, thank you so much. Oh wow. Um, <laughs> I was wondering if you can talk more about like with um, movies that are so visually based like this and have so much like symbolism in the production, like how do you infuse the themes and like the crux of the story into the script? Well, first of all, obviously a lot of the visual choices are down to the director and cinematographer. So those are th things that sometimes are choices that are made 
during production or pre-production as opposed to in the writing process. But, and, and for Guillermo, so much of the visuals are thematic, and so he's thinking of that way, way ahead of time. Um, but for me, I've always found that theme is a particularly useful sort of thing to hang my hat on as a writer because if you know what your theme is, then whatever the background is of any scene can be about that. And so it gives you an answer to, gosh, I've got to have these five guys at a bus station. What are they going to talk about? They're talking about the theme, right? So it, it, it always helps me to sort of have something feel cohesive and really of a piece. Um, and I guess I, I would say the longer I work, the more I am aware of the visual elements of that. I think in the very beginning, to me, it was all just dialogue. And now I'm more aware, OK, there is a director who's going to come in, and I can show them what I mean thematically and, and visually. But the more that the script has a clear vision, it's going to help, obviously, the production yes. designer, sound guy, you know, the gaffers down the, right down the yes, row. Yes, but you know, for a long time now, it's been sort of out of style to write in such a way that you seem to be telling the director okay. what to shoot. So you're not supposed to write like, pan left. You know, <laughs> you're supposed to say like, we look over our left shoulder or whatever. And so, um, you know, it's interesting how much of that you want to try to sort of dictate to them or even show to them. You, you can, and they can choose to ignore it completely. All right, we have time for one more. Hello. Uh, I had a, a more technical question in terms of the writing. I was curious of how the process of co-writing this screenplay was. Like, did you guys meet and review each other's work or, you know? Uh... <laughs> that was the interesting thing. So I met with Guillermo probably, as I said, twice before I started, and then maybe two or three times after that. Um, and we, it began, I think I, you know, he had, pages that he showed me and he had an outline and then I sent him some pages and, and we talked about that. We talked about what I had sent and what we were trying to do and sort of, you know, course corrected a little bit. And then I think after that I never saw him again until, <laughs> I don't even know when I saw him again. I guess I, I saw him again like a year later. But so after that we would just send drafts back and forth. and. I, Guillermo spoke about it, and I think it's the way he maybe prefers to work. To me, it was very surprising, but I didn't mind it at all because I felt like, well, I know what he thinks because of what he's done to the draft. So it'll come back to me, and some of my things will be changed, um, and vice versa. And um, I would say to him, since he's the director, um, OK, so are there any parameters around what I can do? Do you want me to only polish? Do you want me to only work on this part? Do you want me to, um, and he almost always said, no, do whatever you think should be done. And so I did. And you know, I, the wisdom of that, who knows? Because obviously he's the director. If I take out one of his scenes, he can put it back. But my <laughs> thinking on it was the more uh, established and successful you become as a director in Hollywood, I think, the harder it is to get people to tell you the truth about your work. And so one thing I thought I could offer him as a collaborator was, I will give you my honest opinion regardless of whether I think it's going to be popular. Um, and so I really sort of stuck to that. And who knows, you know, you'd have to ask him how useful that was. But I felt like I owed it to him to give him always the very best draft that I thought we could generate. So is that kind of rare in Hollywood, being able to tell a director? Well, I, you know, I don't know. I mean, I haven't worked directly with so many directors, but certainly I think most people don't say to you, like, be merciless, destroy my work, right. take out my scenes. And Guillermo was really like, do whatever you want to do. Like, I, you know, I want to see what you think. Um, but yeah, I think, I mean, I do think that certain directors become so successful. I, I can only imagine that's how it happens, that you see these great established directors who end up with a film where it's five hours and it should have been two, or it's incredibly boring, or it's incredibly, you think to yourself, now how on earth do they not have friends who said to them, <laughs> hey, what? Um, and so I, I think you, you'd have to try to sort of, you know, be that. All right, we always end our Q&As and shows with the same question. 
Uh, can you tell us about a, a movie theater experience you had, perhaps as a child, that maybe inspired you, or some great experience you had with a certain movie, you know, maybe with your family? Mm. A movie theater experience that inspired me. Um, my mother taught a film class in college when I was a child, and she snuck me in to see Wizard of Oz. Oh. And that was indeed inspiring. Uh, well, that's it. To, uh, tonight's actually a special night for us because I'm losing two of my beloved interns. Oh, no. Shannon Pepper, who has been my producer tonight, wrangling oh. me, and Giselle Langley, who's been our, my camera person oh. for the past year. Shannon's graduating. Giselle <laughs> is moving on, too. <laughs> Very sad. And you, uh, you've crafted such a beautiful film. Uh, from an extreme perspective, it's heartfelt, entertaining, and it's something to say. Thank you so much for coming tonight oh, and sharing you your movie and your thoughts you. with all of us.